Who are you this evening on this Good Friday? There's so many different people in here, different backgrounds. I don't know where you've come from, the joy or the sorrow, but we all come tonight with a story to tell. And as we look at the Good Friday service, as we look at the story, do you come tonight as a proud Pharisee, a religious leader, someone who's grown up in the church and knows all the right answers, having religion and power as your cape? Do you come as one thinking it is the government and its power that will save you? Or maybe you come as One in the crowd caught up in the melee of shouting, crucify him, crucify him. Unable to think for yourself. Maybe tonight you come as one of the Roman guards in all their atheistic duty, driven obedience. Don't question authority. Don't question culture. Just do what you are told. Maybe you come as a Judas who has pretended to love Jesus for so long, but all along is a thief and a traitor. An actor who convinced everyone around him, but not Jesus. Do you come tonight as the bold and rash Peter who cuts off the high priest's servant's ear with all of his zeal? Or the sheepish Peter who denies Jesus three times and is cut to the soul as Jesus looks at his eyes? Do you come as the loving John who, as the guards are there, runs away and gets his cloak taken from him? Or the John who immediately goes to the house where Jesus is being held for trial? Or maybe you have no idea why you're here. You're like Simon of Cyrene. You just, you just were going on your way and you kind of got drugged in here tonight. Do you come as the arrogant pilot who washes his hands or maybe the bemused and confused Barabbas who is supposed to be crucified and yet is released? Do you come as one of the mocking soldiers who beats and spits on the Son of God? Or, or maybe you come tonight as Mary, the mother of Jesus, whose soul has been pierced as she watches her son die. I don't know your story. I don't know what's going on in your life. But Jesus does. And he has you here tonight to identify with this tragic story. And we're all a part of this night. This is all a part of who we are, the cross. It's what brings us here tonight. It is what brings us life to gaze upon this one man. And if we're going to be left here changed, we need to understand three truths about tonight, about Good Friday. And the first truth I want you to think and consider is the truth of your unworthiness. Yes, you come to church and I'm calling you out. Your unworthiness. And some of you in here are saying, yes, that's me. I'm, I'm unworthy. But I want to I hit you with something because the, the truth of this unworthiness is the truth of the unconverted soul. You see, Satan has a way of tricking us And the person who ought to think himself as worthy thinks of himself as unworthy. And the one who truly is unworthy actually thinks himself as worthy. Test this tonight. Go out for dessert. Put it on Caleb's tab. And ask anybody in there. If you were to die tonight, why? why, And and, and God asked you why you should go into heaven, what let you into heaven, what would that person's response be? What's the answer? Because I'm what? A good person. Essentially because I'm worthy. I am worthy. Some of you have been sitting in church a long time. There are a lot of 
so-called Christians that are unconverted. They have sat in the pew week after week. They have maybe even served week after week. But if the cross and what has happened on the cross has not transformed their lives, then they remain in an unworthy state. You see, just your humanness makes you unworthy. You being alive today makes you unworthy because of the fall, because of Adam and Eve, because in their perfection, in their worthiness, they listened to the serpent. They disobeyed the father and they brought forth sin. You see, we should be able to look up at the skies, it says in Romans 1.20, that God has been clearly seen. We should know better. We should be without excuse. But no, we suppress the truth and we mock and we are God-haters. The truth of your unworthiness, there are two types of people. You are either converted or not converted. You have either had your sin taken care of or you will take care of your sin. For Romans 3.23 says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Every single person has begun with the unworthiness. It is not until God comes through. It is not because the, the night that we celebrate tonight where this cross does something actually does something because of who hangs on that tree that we can have the opportunity to become worthy. You see, in James 2, it says, for whoever keeps the entire law, yet fails at just one point, is guilty of breaking all of it. That is not fair, God. That is impossible to do. Anybody who's driven up the 14 knows <laughs> you're damned. Your one sin has broken the entire law and you are unworthy of that ability. You see, what happens is we go from being worthy to be with Jesus in the garden to sin entering the world. And it doesn't matter how good we think we are. We are not able to be with Jesus anymore. We can't enter the garden. There is an angel with a sword saying no entry. Why? Because we went from being worthy to being unworthy. We went from being pure to being impure. I mean, it's a little bit like this. Awesome. It's not that much spit, guys. It's like 16 fluid ounces. Like if you shake it enough, how much spit will you actually get? You see, the issue now is this is tainted. It doesn't matter how much it's tainted. We all would say gross. You see, the problem now with this is that we can no longer fellowship with God because God is holy. He is pure. He is set apart and he will not allow sin to taint him. It is impossible for us. There is a wall. There's an impossibility. We can't get back to Jesus. We can't get back to heaven. We can't get what our hope and our heart's desire most longs for, which is why this night's so important. You see, this, this is us in our unconverted state. We are unworthy, but praise be to God that the cross comes in and Jesus comes in and he takes care of this. 
The cross brings together my unworthiness and his worthiness and it crashes together with the great exchange. He takes all of my unworthiness and he gives me all of his worthiness so that I can have fellowship with the Father once again. Hebrews 9.22 says it this way, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. You see, the economy of God is blood. It's hard for us to understand that, but it's this, right? This is our economy. I can go and I can buy something right now. This is our economy. If I asked you to go buy me a Coke, I would have the money. You would have the money. You could do it. This is our economy. God's economy is that cross. And you couldn't pay it because you weren't ready. You weren't willing. You weren't able because you're not perfect. And in John chapter 1, 29, John says, look, the Lamb of God, who what? Amen. He is able. He is worthy and the only one. How? Why? Because he merited your salvation. Did you guys realize that salvation is by works? Let me continue. It's the perfected Christ who was able to merit and obey perfectly so that he could be the one who fulfills the law perfectly. You couldn't, he could. You are enabled, he is capable. You couldn't do it, he did it on that cross for you. The cross exchanges your unworthiness for his worthiness. The cross purchases your humanness and it gives you divinity. It gives you the ability to be with God. Listen to this and I want you to look at that cross when I read this in Colossians 2. When you were dead in your trespasses and in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all of our trespasses, having canceled the debt ascribed to us in the decrees that stood against us. He took it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, having taken it away, Satan thinks he's victorious. The snake thinks he's having victory and he crushes the snake's head. He takes it away. He nails it to the cross. He disarms the powers. He disarms authorities. And then here's what Jesus does on that night. He makes a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by that cross. You see, what he does is he takes this and he gives you newness of life. He changes you. You are still broken. You are still Weak, this thing, if I hit it hard enough, still opens up. It's still a flimsy body, but it can now be with God once again. It can now have fellowship with God once again. It can now enter God's presence once again. Why? Because it is Christ in you, the hope of glory. And you know, some, some Christians, some unconverted souls, some people who have sat in this pew for years on end, listening to godly preaching again and again and again. If I were to say, why should God let you into heaven? What would some of their answers be? Because I'm a good person. It sounds different, but it sounds like this. Because I go to church. Because I tithe. Because I'm a good dad. It is not good enough. You have fallen short of the glory of God. One sin has broken all of the law. And because of that, you have to have Christ. You have to be converted. You have to be born again. And so the answer, when we come before the throne and God says, why should I let you into heaven? The answer is Jesus It's the simple Sunday school answer that's always the right answer. It's Jesus. He is the hope. 
He is the glory. He is the manifestation. He is the fullness of deity dwelling in bodily form. He is the meritor of our salvation. He is the purchaser of our debt. He is the mocker of Satan. And he is the coming king riding on the white horse. And he will not be coming back as a suffering servant. The cross is taken down. The white horse is coming. A sword is coming out of his mouth. And every knee will bow. And every tongue will confess. That is why you're here tonight. Beg of you to bow your knee now. Don't walk out of this room with an unconverted heart. Don't be an unconverted Christian. Be born again. And so the truth of your unworthiness is demolished at the cross. And what happens that Satan does is he's constantly lying. That is his language. It's lie after lie. And when the person who is unworthy thinks he's worthy, the Christian sometimes thinks he's what? Unworthy. No, brothers and sisters, you are the most worthy of all. Why? Because Christ in you, the hope of glory. You are worthy because you are no longer a slave to sin. The bondage has been broken. The debt has been paid. You are no longer your old self. You are a new man and a new creation. Romans 6 says it this way. We know that the person we used to be, look at the cross. It was crucified with him to put an end to the sin of our bodies. Because of this, we are no longer slaves to sin. When Satan comes and says, you look at you again, you are unworthy. You preach the gospel to him. You resist him. You stand firm and he flees from you. Why? Because that cross makes you worthy because of Christ's redemption, because of the blood that has been bought, he redeems you and you are now worthy. The person who has died has been freed from sin. You are worthy, saints. You are worthy because it is no longer you who lives. Listen, when I get to heaven, I don't want for Jesus to look at me and say, oh, there's Curtis. I want the father to look at me and say, oh, there's my son. I'm covered in the blood of Christ. I want to wear Christ. I want to be conformed into his image. I want to make sure that what I do is in line with what he does, that as a co-heir with Christ, I answer, why should I let you into heaven? And I say, Jesus, his blood was purchased for me and I'm a gift. Jesus was received a gift. I'm a gift that God gave from the father to his son. And now I have the spirit living within me as a guarantee promising me to enter in. That's why. Not because I'm a preacher. Not because I'm an American. But because it's Christ. That's the converted soul. We are not unworthy. It's a lie. We are a redeemed soul. You are no longer a slave to sin. You are no longer the one who's living. It is Christ in you. The life I now live, I live by believing in God's son who loved me and he took the punishment for my sins. I don't reject God's kindness. It is his kindness that leads us to repentance. If we receive God's approval by obeying the laws and the scriptures, the Christ's death was pointless. Who has bewitched you, foolish Galatians? You start in the spirit. Are you trying to perfect yourself in the flesh? Stop. It's already done. The cross is already done. The sin has already been paid for. Think of this. Christ is no more pleased with you today than the day he first bought you. Sin is not suddenly paid again and again and again. All of your sin, past, present, and future, is paid for. It's done. It is finished. Now go live, Christian. 
Be who you are. Live out who you are. You are worthy because the counselor is in you. Because you are a new creation. 2 Corinthians 5. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old things have passed away. And behold, new things have come. Brothers and sisters, when we walk out of this room, we walk out of this room as children of the Most High. We walk out of this room as saints, holy ones, perfected ones, justified ones. Do you guys know what justified means? Just as if I hadn't sinned. Just as if I am Christ. God looks down Uh, Me, and he sees Christ because he saw Curtis on the cross and he poured out all of his wrath. And it pleased him. It pleased the father to crush the son. This is how he demonstrated his love for you. You never have to question when you're in cancer, when you have horrible Good Fridays, when you don't get it, when life seems to be a tidal wave, and you say, God, where are you? God, where are you? He's there. While you are still a sinner, Christ died for you. What else do you want? What else do you need for him to prove his love for you? Well, he has more. He's given you himself the promised Holy Spirit. What else does he have for you? He's given you heaven. And it's all been paid for. It's all free. And so children, Satan loves to attack by opposites. He loves to lie. When you are really unworthy and unconverted, he makes you believe that you are worthy. If you believe that you're worthy this morning, ask yourself, do you know the son? Do you have the son? For he who has the son has life and he who does not have the son does not have life. Do you have the son? Listen, some of us in here, we know Jesus. My question is, does Jesus know you? I know who Joe Biden is. He has no idea who I am. And some of us in this room know Jesus. And some of us in this room are going to hear Jesus say, I have never known you. Depart from me. But didn't we preach in your name? Didn't we do miracles? Didn't I do this cool illustration? It doesn't matter. You need Jesus. The blood of Christ, the cross, the spectacle. Now accept it. And walk out of this room as a regenerate person who's a lover of Christ and wants to proclaim that love to the world. Because that is what changes people. The pleasure of Jesus Christ is what changes people. Your joy in Christ is what changes people. Listen to me. Jim Bice dying in the next couple of minutes. That's his hope. That's his hope. As I call him and he says, Curtis, I'm going to be seeing Jesus soon. And I say, I know, brother, you're so lucky. And he says, I know, I can't wait through tears because we are still in this body. I want to die well. I want you to die well. We must live well. We must aim towards that. So that when it comes, when I drive home tonight and I get hit by a drunk driver and my body is crushed and my life is snatched away, that you sit here and you stand here and we sing songs in two weeks from now and we say, amen, he is where he ought to be. He is where he is because that is where we ought to be back with Christ in the garden, in fellowship. 
So Romans 7 happens. This battle's going on in Paul's life. The difficulties are going on in Paul's life. The, the things I want to do, I don't do. Is he saved? Is he converted? There's controversy. But what we do know is Romans 8.1 happens. And Romans 8.1 is powerful. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. God, would you redeem anybody who's not in here tonight? Would you give them eyes to see and ears to hear? Would you strengthen your children tonight? Would you give them the hope and the reality and the knowledge that they are worthy, not because of anything that is in them, but because you are in them. And because you are in them, you give us the strength and the energy and the power to put to death the misdeeds of the body. When we mess up, let us confess. But that's not who we are. And so let's run this race. Let us persevere to the end. Let us preach with zealousness. Let us understand that those around us, they are wanting pleasure. Let us offer to them the great delight and pleasure of Jesus. Let us help them to taste and see that God is good. And all of God's people said,